Thank you that we serve a Savior who loves us. And I often say, I think so many times, whether it's just how we were raised or how we grew up, but we have this image in our minds that God is this angry old man in heaven looking to punish us or scold us, and we could just never live up to being worthy of being in his presence. Yet, Scripture teaches us that he, yes, abstains sin and doesn't want us to live that life, but he loves us, and he loves you, and he knows you, and he knows what you're facing. And as that song said, you're on his mind, and he loves you, and he knows you, and you're not here by accident this morning. God wants to speak and work in your life if you let him. First Peter in your Bible, and uh, we're in chapter 2, looking at verses 13 through 25. And uh, I think uh, the Lord would have us finish chapter 2 here this morning, and then for starting next week, as we kind of go into the Christmas season, we'll probably take a pause in First Peter for just a few weeks and uh, jump back into the new year. But I wanted to finish the entire chapter, and so it's going to be a lot of ground that we're going to cover here this morning. We're going to move quickly, so we'll turn to a couple different passages of Scripture. So if you can keep up, I'd encourage you to turn to those verses. If not, just listen. The first part, as we dive into this, is going to seem kind of like a, a Bible study in a way, but I promise if you stick with it, we're going somewhere, and God has something for us. By way of review... The book of 1 Peter is obviously written by the Apostle Peter, the second most prominent man in the gospel. The man who you know, if you've heard the story, walked on the water to Jesus and then when he took his eyes off of Jesus, he fell in the water. The man who denied Christ after he said he wouldn't deny Christ. The man that God used to preach to thousands and to bring people to the gospel. A very well-known man throughout scripture is Peter. And here he is, he's writing this letter to Christians. If you look in verse 1, you remember the different provinces in modern day Turkey where they are scattered abroad, they are suffering for their faith, they are being persecuted for their faith in so many ways. And so Peter is writing this letter, this entire book, and all the chapters in it, all five chapters, to encourage these Christians and to remind them through their suffering, their is hope through their suffering through their trials christ is working and may that be a common theme throughout the book but also a common theme that we remember on our minds and hearts every single day we all go through trials we all go through sufferings we all face things in our life maybe you're facing something today but God's word teaches us that as a believer of Christ, a child of God, he can work through your trial, he can work through your suffering, and he can bring you closer to him as a result of it. And so five Sundays ago, about five weeks ago now, we began chapter two, and uh, we were challenged to lay aside some qualities that are not characteristic of a growing Christian. Four weeks ago, we looked at verses four and six and remembered how Christ is the living stone. Two weeks ago, we were challenged to value Christ, to build our lives on the foundation of Christ, and to show forth in this world being a light and a testimony for Christ. Last Sunday, if you were here, we, reminded, we were reminded that we are pilgrims to this world. Our identity is in Christ, and our ultimate destination, if you're a believer of Christ, is in heaven with our Heavenly Father. We learn to abstain from the flesh and to yield to the Spirit Daily, And so now we're going to jump right into it, into chapter 2, verse 13 through 17. I'll read verse 13 and then we'll go through. It says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme. And Peter continues to go on and give some practical teaching and principles for these Christians, for these believers. And so as I read verses 13 through 17, if you would, I label that Peter is teaching that as believers, we are to show proper submission to authority. In this context of 1 Peter, he's talking about the civil government. And so I'm going to teach again. This is first part, kind of like a Bible study, but stick with me because we want to understand the actual context here, what Peter is teaching. He says, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. 
Meaning what? He's telling these Christians that, hey, as believers, be good citizens. Submit to authority. Now, as believers, thousands of years later, as we read this word, we find the same truth and apply it to our lives that as Christians, we ought to be decent, civil, good citizens submitting to the authority in our lives, meaning following the rules, means obeying the law, meaning do what God wants us to do as citizens so that we can be a testimony in this world. Now this, if you study Jewish history, was very different from the zealous Jews that Peter's writing here. They recognized no king. They didn't recognize any king or queen or president. All they recognized was God. They paid taxes to no one except God. And so Peter is telling them, hey, submit to the authority, follow and obey the law, because by doing so, you're going to be a good testimony to those around you. Why should we do this? Well, we see here in 1 Peter, he says, Submit to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Since those in authority, since the civil government is a rightful authority for God, we are bound to obey them. Now, hear me out. Unless, of course, Peter's teaching, submit to authority, submit to the civil government of your day, but yet, of, co of course, unless, of course, they order us to do something in contradiction to God's law. Then, the Bible teaches that we are commanded to obey God before man. And you can read Acts chapter 4. We won't turn there for sake of time. But the religious leaders of the day and the government were trying to tell the apostles not to preach and not to teach. And if they would, they would be arrested. And the disciples said, hey, you know, we listen to God first. He's the ultimate authority in our lives, and they were then arrested for it. So you find the balance, you find the wisdom and the discernment in what Peter is saying. Hey, listen, obey the law, be a good citizen, pay your taxes, be a moral person, be someone of high approach, uh, above reproach, be someone who has character. Because when people look at you, what they were trying to do in that day was look at the Christians and say, man, they're bad citizens. They're, they're bad people. They contribute nothing to society. And in doing so, it was a bad testimony for Christ. So Peter's saying, submit to the authority. Be a good citizen. Pay your taxes. Have a, have, be a man and a woman, a Christian of character. And God will be honored and blessed. And also, it will give your enemies no room to question you or to question your faith. Instead, they'll look at someone and say, man, they're a good citizen, yet they love their Savior. There's something different about them. But again, we draw the truth today in 2023 that, yes, we are to be good citizens. And, yes, we are to submit to authority and pay our taxes and not break the law and do this. The Bible says here in First Peter that is thankworthy to God. God wants us to do that. Unless, of course, there ever comes a day where we are taught or we are pressured to do something that contradicts God's word. Then, in love and humility, and Acts teaches us, we stand for God. We stand behind this book because in our lives, in our church, and as believers, this right here is the ultimate authority. But Peter's going to say here that does not give us an excuse to not be moral citizens above reproach of good character. And so let's continue going on. He says in verse 14 of chapter 2, he says, as those who are sent by him. He says, our governors who are sent by him. Now, I think this is interesting because Peter's also, he's insisting that rulers are sent by God. Governments are sent by God. And we find two different truths in that, in that context that, yes, God puts governments in position to make sure that people are following the law and there's order, but also to remind us that the governors and the mayors and the presidents and the leaders, their heart is in the hand of God. God is in ultimate control. God raises leaders and takes leaders down. And although there may not be someone who we like or someone who we do like at whatever period of time and whatever office you want to consider, we must remember as Christians that at the end of the day, God is in ultimate control. He's in authority. He knows what he's doing. He's not shocked. He's not caught off guard. He's not surprised. And so as Christians, we are to trust him. I, I think that's interesting, as he says, as those who are sent by him. Then look at verse 15. He says, 
that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Again, we looked at this in 1 Peter, but Peter knew that our conduct is a way to defend the gospel. If we're living a life where we don't pay taxes and we break the law and we're criminals and we lie and we cheat and we steal, people are not going to look at us and say, I want their faith. Oh, there's something different about them. No, no. Peter says, hey, be a good citizen. Be a person of character. Hey, and by the way, can I say, in our day and age today, you know that's what we need is believers who have character and integrity. That's what we need to be teaching our children and our babies downstairs to be people of character and integrity, to tell the truth even when it's not fun or popular, to do the right thing, to submit to authority, hey, to just shut our mouths sometimes and just to be the bigger person, to live above reproach. Peter says that God is honored and glorified when we live that way, and he will bless us for that. Now, don't get me wrong, we can go to a whole other sermon. There are times where we need to speak up for ourselves. Proverbs says sometimes we need to answer a fool according to his folly. And the same verse, he says, don't answer a fool according to his folly. Meaning what? There are some times we need to stand for God and answer, but the majority of the time, we're better off just keeping our mouths closed. Following God, trusting him, submitting to authority, and living a life of integrity. And notice verse 16, he says, As free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as servants of God. Again, what's he saying? We are warned against taking the liberty we have in Jesus as an excuse for sin. Instead, we are to use our liberty in Jesus to show the kind of love and respect that Peter is teaching us here. Meaning what? Oh, because I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, I can do this. I can get away with this. God will forgive me. Peter says, no, no, no. Don't use your faith as a cloak of maliciousness. Live above reproach. Be people of character. Be people of integrity. Teach your children that. Teach your, have that in, in your relationship and in, in your job and with your employers. And even though sometimes, you know, they may be in the wrong and they may do this or that. Be someone above reproach. Have character. Why? Because you're pointing people back to Jesus Christ. Your life is a testimony for Christ. And when people see you and when people see me, do they see someone who's always just trying to buck the system and, and rebel and, and cause trouble? Or do they see someone who, you know what, I'm just going to live above reproach. I'm going to have character and integrity in my life. I'm going to trust the Lord. And I want people to see Christ through me. And that's what Peter's teaching here. Now, we kind of transition verses 13 through 17 where he teaches as believers we are to show proper submission to authority. And then verse 18 through 20, we read those few verses and it's very practical because what he's saying is as believers, we are to submit again to our authority, but in this context, our employers. So it's essential to remember that many of Peter's Christians, readers, the ones who are reading this letter, they were poor. They had authority in their life. They had someone they worked for. Some of them were still in this time, in this culture, they were still slaves with masters. And they were very likely to face mistreatment. And Peter's well aware of this as he's writing this letter. And so he is teaching them, hey, and he acknowledges the unjust suffering will bring them pain and sorrow. He does not call that a good thing. He does not call the position they're in a good thing, but he's encouraging these Christians to endure their suffering by trusting in God and reminding them that Jesus was also treated unjustly and Jesus also was treated unfairly, but God was with him and used him for his glory. And so he's encouraging these Christians, hey, keep your mouth closed, trust the Lord, God will bring you through this, God has you, God sees you, God knows you. And so the practical application I draw from that when I read these verses is that in our own lives we are to follow and submit, yes, to the authority in our lives. Not always trying to cause trouble, not always trying to be a rebel, but be someone, again, of character in civil government and in our jobs. Do our job. Do it ethically. Do it right. Clock in when you're supposed to clock in. Clock out when you're supposed to clock out. Be above reproach. And when you're mistreated or you face suffering, trust God He'll see you through it. Verse 21 through 25, and here's where we get to the meat, all right? Those first few verses, again, we don't, when we go verse by verse, we're, we can't just skip around where we want, okay? If I wanted to, I would have started with verse 21 through 25, but we go through and, and we see the context and what the Bible's teaching, but here, verses 21 through 25, 
is where I believe we'll find the spiritual truth, okay? So we're transitioning from the teaching to now to the preaching. Verse 21 through 25, let's read. He says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, and if you underline things in your Bible, here's one I would underline, leaving us an example, that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For you were a sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Peter ends the chapter by reminding us this. It's all about Jesus Christ. No matter where you're at in your life, no matter what you're going through, no matter what practical teaching, it all comes back to Christ. And he says there in verse 21 through 23, Jesus is our example in our life. The life that Christ lived is the life that we should follow and pattern ourselves after. Now, I often think of when someone tells me or gives me instruction to do something and they say just for that as example, follow Christ. Do what Christ did. Let him be your example. Okay, well, practically speaking, how? What did Christ do? How can I apply that to my life now? Peter says he's our example. Well, how is he our example? Keep your finger in 1 Peter and real quickly turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, it's a couple pages back here in the New Testament. Philippians chapter 2, one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Philippians chapter 2 and we're going to look at verse 5 through 8 really quick. As we're, now stick with me, we're, we're looking at how is Christ, Peter says, he's our example to follow Jesus with your life. Sir, ma'am, husband, wife, mom, dad, wherever you're at in your life, it would do you good, teenager, young adult, to not let some politician or some athlete or some musician be your example in life to follow or who you pattern your life after. But what would do us all well is to pattern our lives after Jesus Christ. And that's what Peter's teaching us here. Now look at Philippians chapter 2 real quick, verse 5 through 8. He says this, Paul's writing, he says, let this mind be in you. That phrase, let this mind be in you, it, it, when you translate it down from the Greek, it's meaning the direction. Go in this same direction. Let this mind be in you. Follow this direction, which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay, now he's going to give us the practical example that Christ lived in his life. Look at verse 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Verse 7, ready? But made himself of no reputation. Okay, so we're following the example of Christ. What was Christ's example? We see first in that, in that passage of scripture, Christ made himself of no reputation. Say, what does that mean? Pastor, he didn't want to be popular? No, no. What he's saying is that Jesus Christ emptied himself. Now stick with me. Oftentimes when I read this chapter, I glance over that phrase. But to me, it's no accident that the first thing Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes in this list is emptying yourself. Why? What does that mean, empty yourself? Because I believe in the Christian life that is the key to everything. One of the main things that will hinder us from being like Christ and having a sincere, devout relationship with Him is pride. Making it all about us. All about self all about our desires, all about our lusts. But when Jesus came to this earth, his example was this, Paul said, he emptied himself. It wasn't about him or his needs. And so we're challenged here right off the bat in this list. Hey, you want to be like Christ? The first thing you need to do is empty yourself. Humble yourself. Pride exists in every one of us. And it keeps us from being effective Christians. But more importantly, it hinders us from having a relationship with God. Have humility in your child rearing. Have humility in your marriage. So many times in our marriages, what we fight. Why? Because we're just full of pride and we want it our way or we're too stubborn or we're too angry. We want to follow the example of Christ and have a heart of humility, emptying of ourselves, of our agendas, making everything about Christ and other people and showing his love. And that is how one of the ways we follow the example of Christ. 
Look, he goes on, he says, he made himself of no reputation. Look at verse 7, he says, he took upon him the form of a servant. Okay, so what's the example? Peter says, remember in 1 Peter, follow the example of Jesus. What's the example of Jesus? Well, humble yourself. Empty yourself. And then he says, he took on the form of a servant. Meaning what? Serve and love people. Serve and love people. You want to be like Christ this morning? Serve and love other people. Hey, we can all do it. We can all help each other out, especially this holiday season, right? You know, it's a, it's a time for a lot of people where maybe you lost a loved one or you're going through a hard time and it can bring some grief, it can bring some loneliness, it can, it can just bring that, that, that spirit that's just kind of tough to deal with. And as Christians, can we go around, especially this time of year, and serve and love people? Can we encourage them? Hey, we're, we're praying for you. Hey, can you come over to my house for a meal? Hey, can I, can I, can I make you something? Let's be servants. Why? Because that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. He was a servant. He loved people. Continue with this list. Ready? He made himself of no reputation. He took on the form of a servant. And then it says this, he made himself in the likeness of men. He made himself in the likeness of men. Here we find that Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, assumes a more humble rank and station. Meaning what? And we're going through this list, you're doing great. Ready? It's not about position. It's not about where we're at. It's not about where we rank. It's not about being in charge all the time. It's not about being in control all the time. It's just about living a humble life submitted to God. And Jesus was the Son of God. He was God himself. He could have came down to this earth with authority and said, I'm in charge. Here's what we're going to do and wipe out the enemy. He could have done all of that, but he set aside his rank. Meaning what? As Christians, if we're going to follow the example of Jesus Christ, empty yourself. Don't have pride. Serve and love other people. Set aside rank. It's not all about you. It's not all about me. It's about Christ. It's about others. Look down at the next verse. He says, again, he hits this point. He says, he humbled himself. Now, I won't stay long on this because we already touched on it, but it's a little different angle that I believe uh, in the context this verse takes. It says he humbled himself, meaning what? He submitted to authority. Kind of what Peter was teaching in 1 Peter. The creator of the world was not always trying to buck authority or cause trouble. He stood for God, but in love and humility, and he was the ultimate pattern for you and me. Follow the example of Christ, humble yourself, empty yourself, serve and love other people. And notice that last phrase in verse 10. I'm sorry, verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and notice this, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You know what I get from that? You want to follow the example of Jesus Christ in your life? Obey this book right here. You want to follow the example of Christ? Be obedient to this book. Sometimes this book teaches us some things that are hard, like, hey, turn the other cheek. How about this? Pray for your enemies. That's a hard one. I don't know about you, but it's a hard one for me. Pray for your enemies. Hey, don't gossip. Don't slander. Build people up. Live a life of honesty and integrity. Seek God. Pray. Teach your children how to love the Lord and have a foundation of faith in their life. Follow and obey this book. And in doing so, you're following the example of Christ. And when you follow the example of Christ, I promise you, you'll live a lot more of a blessed life with a peace and a joy that's unshakable even when circumstances around you are going crazy. Now turn back to 1 Peter, and we're, we're landing the plane here in a moment. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, we learn in the first few verses of, last few verses of 21 through 23, follow the example of Jesus in our life. We looked at Philippians, how we can practically do that. But now we look at verse 24, and he says what? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live under righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. So we understand, follow the example of Jesus. Follow his life. And then in this verse we learn, Jesus is our substitute in his death. Jesus died as the sinner's substitute, Peter says. Jesus did not die as a martyr, but as a sinless substitute, a savior. Now, when you study Jewish history, the Jewish people did not crucify criminals. Normally, they stoned them to death. But if you were really just extra evil in their eyes, and you just committed a, a, a crime that was just unimaginable, 
They would take that criminal and they would hang them on a tree and leave them there nailed to that tree until evening time. From morning to evening just to suffer a slow, brutal, bloody, painful torture and death. And that's what they would do for the criminals who were just beyond evil. And when you read scripture, you understand that's exactly what Jesus Christ did for you and me. He was our substitute. Peter says, remember, Christians, he's our example. But remember also, he's your substitute. He suffered and died for you because he loved you. Because he saw you. Because he didn't want to see you go to hell. Because he wanted you to be in heaven someday. Jesus Christ loves you. And through their suffering and through their trial, Peter's reminding them of that truth. And here this morning, I stand before you as we enter the holiday season in a time where, yes, you can struggle. And yes, there can be some feelings and, and some depression and some anxiety and some fear. And to stand before you, preaching the word of God and reminding you what Peter reminded those believers who were suffering, a simple but powerful truth that God loves you. He loves you. I started off the service by saying, we think God's this old man in heaven that's just out to get us. No, God's love is chasing you this morning. God wants you to be saved. God wants you to accept him and put your faith in him. He wants to work in your life. He wants to work in your marriage. He wants to work in your children. He's chasing after you. He's moving pieces in your life that you don't even realize that's a result of why you're even here this morning. Because he wants you to hear this message. That he loves you, and that he knows you, and that he's there for you, and that he substituted his life on the cross so that one day you can have eternal life. And if you're here this morning, I'll say in the invitation in a few moments, you know I always preach it, I always teach it, I always give an opportunity. But if you're not sure you're a believer of Jesus Christ, please don't leave here today without making that decision. God loved you. He died for your sin. He's your substitute. And he wants to work in your life. And then Peter ends it with what I think was probably for me personally the most encouraging truth in verse 25. Look what he says. Jesus is our example. Jesus is our substitute. How about this, verse 25. For you were a sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Jesus is our example. He's our substitute. But get this, if you're a believer, if you're, if you're a child of God this morning, he's your shepherd. He's your shepherd. So what does that, what does that mean, Pastor? You, you study the Old Testament, and what they had to do before Christ died on the cross is they would have to bring a sacrifice, right? The sheep would die, they would bring a lamb, they would bring a sheep, and they would offer a sacrifice for their sin to God. The sheep in the Old Testament had to die for the shepherd, but when you read the New Testament and you study, you understand that the shepherd died for the sheep. And now as believers of Jesus Christ, when, we, when you're not saved and, and you're not a believer, you're a lost sinner, you're like a sheep that's gone astray. You're ignorant, you're lost, you're, you're wandering in danger, you have no peace in your life, you have no joy in your life. You're away from the safety of the shepherd. But now as believers, and I love this truth, and if you've missed anything today, don't miss this. As believers, once we put our faith in Christ, we are returned to the fold of the shepherd, and we are in his care. He's our shepherd. And now I take great comfort in the truth that Peter teaches us. As believers, he's our shepherd. Notice the word he says, bishop. Bishop meaning what? When you break that word down, one who watches over. One who oversees. And as children of God, we can take comfort in the fact that the great shepherd, your heavenly father, sees and knows and is watching over your life. Can I encourage you this morning, that situation right now that's making you very anxious, that decision that's coming up that you have to make very soon, that suffering or trial that you're going through, maybe there's an anger in your heart, maybe there's a bitterness, maybe there's a circumstance you're going through, and say, God, why am I going through this? Can I remind you that your shepherd, your overseer, He's not caught off guard. He sees. He knows what's going on. He sees the situation. And what he's waiting for, God will never force his way into your life. We're, that's not true love. He gives us free will because that's love. We're not robots just programmed to do everything God wants us to do. But as Christians, as believers, 
We take comfort. He's our overseer. But he's also waiting for his sheep to turn to him and to yield to him and to surrender to him and to trust him. God wants to work in your life. And whatever you're going through this morning, can you find encouragement in the fact that God sees he's your shepherd, he's in control, he's doing something? And rather than getting bitter and rather than getting angry and rather than living in anxiety and fear, why don't you turn to God and say, God, I know you're my shepherd, I know I put my faith in you, and I am now in turn trusting you. I don't know the end result of what I'm going through. I don't know how I'm going to get through this situation, this struggle, this new year that's coming up. There's a lot of things that i got to face. I don't know how I'm going to get through it, but it's not my job to figure it out. It's my job just to trust the shepherd who oversees. God's in control. He knows what's going on. He's sovereign. He's merciful. He loves you. And so in the craziness of this life, in the highs and the lows, may we... Remember what Peter teaches us here in these last few verses. As believers, may we follow the example of Christ. May we live lives of humility. May we live lives of integrity. May we serve and love other people. We're so focused on ourselves. Can we get our, get our eyes off ourselves for a moment and encourage and love others? Can we obey this book? Can we study this book? Can we read this word? Can we have devotions with our family? Can we seek God daily? Can we make God the preeminence in our lives and obey this book? Can we follow his example? Can we remember this season that at your worst day, you're still a child of God. At your worst day, he's still our substitute. We don't have to die and go to hell. We can be in heaven one day forever. We can have a relationship with God while we're on this earth because he's our substitute. And then, can we take comfort just in this fact? And I had to remind myself many times of this these last few weeks. God's in control, Zach. Stop trying to figure it out. Stop getting anxious. Stop getting nervous. Stop staying up at night thinking and processing all these things. And instead, just trust God. He's a shepherd. He loves you. He knows you. He's in control. Look how he's, how he's worked in your life thus far. Look how he's worked in your life thus far. He'll continue to do so if you let him. And so I hope this morning, as we go and we turn the calendar into December in the next few days and we go in this holiday season, that can be a low time for many, that we remember Christ is our example, Christ is our substitute, and Christ is our shepherd.